I'm an archaeologist and I work with the Middle Stone Age, which is between 30,000 years ago and about 300,000 years ago. But within that speciality, I do almost anything. So I excavate, I work in the laboratory, I look at stone tools, I look at the plants, uh, and I identify seeds and all kinds of things like that. I'm an archaeobotanist. Um, an archaeobotanist is involved in looking at the plant remains in a site. We call them archaeobotanists in Africa, whereas in America they're often referred to as paleoethnobotanists. And basically what an archaeobotanist does is look at the plants in an archaeological site to tell what plants people were using in the past as well as to document the vegetation when the people were living at the site as well as changing vegetation through time. Uh, my speciality is to look at the seeds in the archaeological remains. So the seeds, we call the study of seeds carpology, and I will collect modern seeds in the environment around a site, and by looking at the modern seeds, I can identify the ancient seeds. But very often I also have to um, char, that means burn, turned into charcoal the seeds because many of the seeds we find have already been charred or carbonized and sometimes they change shape slightly while they burnt and so we need to have a very extensive comparative collection of modern seeds as well as carbonized seeds to be able to identify the ancient seeds. Uh, I should mention that archaeobotanists study not only seeds, but they also study things like pollen. Mm. And so palynologists will study pollen and then be able to also look at um, differences in time through the changing pollen but and at the vegetation, yeah. And then um, we have people who look at phytoliths. I'm a prehistory and specialise into analysing cultural material. So um, more precisely, uh, I uh, am uh, analysing, um, doing chemistry on archaeological materials. So I did my PhD uh, on Namibian side um, to analyse ochre and rock art. And now I'm doing a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at the University of the Witwatersrand uh, with Professor L uh, Lynn Watley on um, hafting to residues uh, from Middle Stone Age um, layers. Here at Red Balloon, there is a quite poor preservation of organic remains. And so we don't won't have a lot of uh, hafting residues on stone tools so I will also analyze the ochre because we got a lot of ochre to understand uh, well the behaviors of the people who uh, once occupied this site. What is ochre? O okay so ochre is a quite general term uh, that refers to um, any uh, rock with uh, some coloring power and usually rich in iron but when I say rich it's even 10% is enough to provide a color and usually those rocks uh, are uh, have a color ranging from yellow to uh, dark including red. So where does the name red balloon come from? The red balloon is a tree with the scientific name Erythrophyza transvalensis, and it has a relatively limited distribution in the northern parts of South Africa into um, Zimbabwe. And at some stage, and even now, quite a few archaeologists felt that perhaps the balloon, the seed of the red balloon, had been used as beads and by Iron Age agriculturalist people and so that the red balloon 
seeds could be traced to where these people had moved. I should rather say that the red balloon tree could be traced because of these people moving with their seeds of the red balloon to make beads. And around this cave, when Lynn first came to look at it, Professor Lynn Wadley, she found red balloon trees and was very excited to see the, the, the tree that's so rare and so decided to call this very special cave Red Balloon Cave. And when we arrived for this field season, there were none of them in flower, but there were a couple of the pods still around with seeds in them. And we collected the seeds to be able to have a modern comparative sample to be able to compare and identify the ancient seeds. So we would like it very much to see where the seeds are found in the deposits, if they are only in the agricultural levels or if they're in the Stone Age levels as well. Because if we are able to identify them in the Stone Age levels, then clearly they weren't brought by the Iron Age people. Um, interestingly, one of the seeds we found now had two beautifully formed little holes. So one can imagine why the people got the idea of actually using them for beads, for a necklace. Um, so that's the story of the red balloon. Did you always know you were going to become an archaeologist? No, I started out as a teacher. And during the school holidays, I used to go and look at rock art. And gradually I became interested in all kinds of archaeology. And so I decided to go to university and to study to become an archaeologist. I'm fascinated by all things that are old. And so the Stone Age seemed more interesting than the Iron Age, the farming region, which many other archaeologists are interested in. So I like origins, and the Middle Stone Age is the origins of Homo sapiens, our own species. So I'm interested to know how our cognition began and what sort of technology was associated with the first people like us with minds like ourselves. And then what famous excavation sites in South Africa have you worked on? I've worked on Border Cave very recently, which has been famous for many years since the early 1900s. That was excavated by Raymond Dart and some other really famous archaeologists. So I've worked on that. I've worked on Sabudu, also in KwaZulu-Natal, on Rose Cottage Cave. Rose Cottage Cave was famous because Tobias excavated there. Mm -hmm. And quite a few of the early politicians joined him in those early days. How do you go about identifying a site? When I go to a site, I always look to see whether it's fairly well preserved. And in the case of the site we're excavating here today, which we've named Red Balloon Shelter, I decided it was really good because the soil within it is very, very dry. And in order to get things like seeds, charcoal, bone, and so on, we need really, really dry sediments. If we were to excavate out in the open, none of those organic things would preserve. Mm. So that's the first thing that I look at, a site that is very dry and well preserved. What would you look for in these sites when you're busy excavating? I'm looking for seeds, I'm looking for grass bedding, I look for bone, animal bone and shell. And here at Red Balloon, what we found in the upper layers was also ostrich eggshell. And sometimes people had made beads out of the eggshell. And we can see how they produced it because of the little fragments that we find in the excavation. They first of all made squares out of the ostrich eggshell, tiny little, tiny little pinky sized pieces of eggshell. And having shaped them square, they then drilled a hole. Yeah. And they would have drilled a hole with a sharp thorn 
or a little piece of stone or something like that. And if the hole was successfully made, then they would shape the bead round afterwards. Do you have a team that accompanies you on these, on these sites? Yes, nobody can work alone in any excavation site because there's so much work to do. But I don't always have the same team, obviously. I mean, I've been excavating for 40 years, so the team has changed quite considerably during that time. When I was a lecturer at the University of the Witwatersrand, I would most often take students and would train them on the excavations. And more recently, I've tended to work um, with other professionals, people who are archaeobotanists, people who are working with animal bone, who can identify that, mm. geologists, people who know art, how to analyze the, the sediment, and also with chemists, because we need to know what the residues are on the stone tools, and we can only do that chemically. What are you currently busy working on? For example, with this red balloon site. Yes, at Red Balloon Shelter, we've been excavating in farmer occupations at the top, probably in the last thousand years. And there we found pottery, we found ostrich eggshell beads, we found bone points. Now, bone points are arrowheads that would have been used for bow and arrow hunting. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they might be used as the tips of little spears, tiny spears. And those bone arrows are so fragile that we know that they had to be used with poison because the bone arrows are just the vehicles for transporting the bone point into the animal. And so they would poison the animal to get their meat. And I know what people are going to ask straight away. How could they eat poisoned meat? Well, the kind of poison that was used in the past was the sort of poison that affects only your bloodstream. So it doesn't affect your stomach. And so you can quite happily eat the poisoned meat without getting ill. But you must not get that poison into your bloodstream. And so people were very careful how they looked after their burn points so that they didn't scratch each other with them. Then what are the normal procedures that you follow at these sites? First thing that I do once I've decided a site is worthwhile is to establish where the driest point is going to be, if it's a cave site or a shelter site, and I will excavate there. In this particular case, I chose the back wall of red balloon shelter because I thought that people would probably make their fires there and in ash you get better preservation than in other sediment. Then I set out a grid. So I have to set out a grid with string and nails so that I work within one uh, meter squares. The next thing we do is to set up a total station which is survey equipment which means that within each of our meter squares, we're going to survey the X, Y, and Z points, giving a sort of GPS reading that will tell you precisely where everything that you excavated came from. So we set that up, we've set our grid up, and then we start excavating very, very slowly from the surface within each of the meter squares. And while we're excavating, we keep a good record with um, excavation forms telling us the color of the sediment, the depth of the deposit that we're excavating, the sort of things that we're getting out. And then, as I mentioned, we survey in each of the things that we lift out of that meter square so that we know the exact position. Then we put all the sediment in a bucket and we sieve it through very fine mesh and sort through it to see whether we missed anything mm -hmm. while we were excavating. And so tiny bits of bead, little bits of shell, little bits of bone, we'll sort through mm -hmm. using a magnifying glass afterwards. And then we put everything in its own bag with its own number from the survey equipment. Do you need to inform anybody that you're digging in a site or their permits? That's a really important question because, first of all, 
you have to be a properly qualified archaeologist in order to excavate a site like this. So you need minimally an honours degree, a science honours degree, with archaeology as your major, and then you can, you can qualify as a professional archaeologist. But nonetheless, in order to excavate, you need to apply for a permit, an excavation permit, from the South African Heritage Agency. And getting that permit takes about three months, so you need to plan well in advance. And in order to get it, you need photographs of the site. You need to have a motivation saying why you want to excavate that site. And of course, you need to get permission from the owner of the land. So we need to get a lot of permissions mm -hmm. before we can excavate. That is very important because if you don't do that, you are looting. And we really would not want a reputation like that. You also need to know that any archaeological material belongs to the state. It doesn't belong to the landowner, it belongs to the state. And, and although you need the landowner's permission to excavate, ultimately the, the state has to own and curate and treasure that heritage in an appropriate place. So I never collect anything for myself. I don't have anything on my mantelpiece. Everything that I collect goes to the university and to the proper collections. Do you have any advice for younger scientists? You know, archaeology is probably as much fun as you can have in any profession. It's not going to earn you a lot of money, but it will earn you a great deal of satisfaction. And if you're passionate about it, you'll want to do it way after you've stopped being paid to do the job. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Did you always know you were going to become an archaeologist? I had no idea I was going to become an archaeologist. I originally wanted to do nature conservation, but I was told, and this of course will reveal my age, I was told when I was in the seven, not when I was in the 70s, in the 1970s, I was told that if I wanted to be a nature conservation officer, I would never be allowed into the field. And that, of course, that kind of gender discrimination doesn't, or sex discrimination doesn't exist now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I wanted to do something that I could be outside and um, also study things to do with nature. And then I discovered archaeology. And I have to say that it's been better than I could ever have imagined, particularly because it's such an eclectic study and there's so many sub-disciplines and you can work with so many different other specialists to be able to find out exactly what happened in the past, mm. what plants people might have used, what animals they ate, and how they organize their lives. Mm -hmm. So how did you come to specialize in botany? Hmm. I think one of the reasons was because I've always been interested in plants, but fortunately I had impetus from a very famous archaeologist called Professor Lynn Wadley. And she encouraged me to um, look at the plants at a site she was digging in KwaZulu-Natal called Subudu Cave and so I was a late starter and so I became a mature student doing an MSc in archaeology but specializing in archaeobotany which um, wasn't really that common at the time for someone to specialize in archaeobotany but specifically in the seeds mm. which was fun. Uh, how do you identify or, well, rather, what are you looking for in these sites specifically as a possible? Okay, so we're hoping to find botanical remains, mm. but the botanical remains unfortunately aren't always preserved. And because of that, they've been very much neglected in the past. Mm. Another reason they've been neglected in the past is because you have to sieve specifically for seeds with very fine sieves. Mm. And 
most people don't have the time while they're in the fields. But what we've shown is that it's worth the effort because of the information you get, both about what the vegetation was like and possibly what fruits and other um, plant materials people were eating. Wow. Do you have any advice for younger scientists? Yes, I'm thinking. <laughs> I think that, um, first of all, you have to really want to do it. You have to have a passion for it to do it because conditions can be quite hard. Yeah. I mean, at Border Cave, we used to have four litres of water a day for all our needs, each. And when you've been in the cave and you've been really dirty, that's a lot to wash yourself and then wash your clothes in yeah. and all the rest. And it's not, it's not easy. So conditions aren't always easy. But in my opinion, the rewards are, you know, far outweigh anything like that because it's so terribly exciting. So to a young scientist, whatever they're going to study, I would say do something that you're really interested in because mm. it's going to be hard work. I mean, archaeology has sometimes hard field conditions, mm. but it's going to be hard work and often there are bits that are a bit boring, but you have to do them to be able to achieve your aims. Mm. So yes, I encourage people to follow their dreams. Thank you. Thank you so much.